Welcome to now another we Spirit Field message on this eccentric message. If you're new to this channel, I would entreat you to hit on that The Bible says, and it came to pass as well, about an eight days this after this thing, because that we believe that as Peter this and John and James and went up into the mountain to you, and then God to is pray. going to visit your home. Thank and as he prayed, the Bible says, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, verse 31, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. 32 is my verse of emphasis. The Bible says, while all of those mighty encounters were happening, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. Mighty things were happening. Prophetic revelations about Jesus' own destiny. And the Bible says they were heavy with sleep. But a miracle happened, and that's our first prayer point this morning. And when they awake, they saw his glory. Not while they were sleeping. The Bible says when they awake, they saw his glory. You never can see his glory in its fullness while you are asleep. Hallelujah. Are we together now? The Bible says, Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ will give you light. There are many people who are asleep spiritually, asleep in terms of consciousness. The difference, the man who is sleeping and the man who, are, who is awake are both alive. The difference is their level of consciousness. The man sleeping is not dead. Are we together now? Yes. So the man who is asleep, and the man who is awake, they are both alive, but they do not have the same experience. One has lost consciousness in the place of sleep, while the other is fully aware and has capacity to receive. Is someone ready to pray? Father, every slumber, in the name of Jesus Christ, every slumber, I awake spiritually by your spirit, I awake spiritually by your grace. I desire to behold your glory. Someone pray. The Bible says, when they awake, they saw his glory. When they were fully awake, they saw his glory. When they awake, they saw his glory. When they awake, they saw his glory. Hallelujah. Second prayer point, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 and 18. There are times you can be awake, but one of the side effects of waking up is that you usually don't see well. You are drowsy, you are weak, your visions are blurred, you see two things, you're not even sure what direction they are. It's one thing to be awake, but it's another thing to be able to see. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, please, from verse 17. Can you help us, media? 2 Corinthians 3, from verse 17. The Bible says, Now the Lord is that spirit. The glory of the Lord are changed, not into a different image, into the same image from glory to glory. Listen, you are not changed into the glory that is available. You are changed into the glory that you behold. There are endless possibilities in the spirit that are available for the believer. But the dimension of God's glory you behold is the dimension you are changed into. Are we together now? Yes. And like you have heard me teach back home that the word glory is the word kabod. It's also the word doxa. It means an examination of anything that makes an individual, the features that make an individual desirable, valuable, expensive, or worthy of your admiration. So when we talk about the glory of God, it's a holistic capture of every dimension in God. His grace, his wisdom, his power, his favor. But the Bible says as we behold him, we are given the liberty to explore any dimension that is available, but it is the part you behold that you become. So it is possible that he can appear here in his glory 
and some people will only behold his wisdom some people will only behold his power some people will only behold his ability to restore but there are many who will say lord i've seen you this way but what else is in you i want to behold you in a higher dimension as we behold him as in a mirror we are changed not into the glory that is available the glory that you see are we together now he told abraham he says lift up your eyes northwards and southwards and eastward and westward he says everywhere your eyes can see that is the one i will give you not the land available the one your eyes can see and you may have heard me teach that sight is a product of two factors one light and number two an eye that can see just because your eyes open does not mean you can see if the light here were shut your eyes will still be functional but you will not be able to see you need light and the eye that works well are we together now so the bible says as we behold we are changed it then means that whilst the word is coming the assignment, you see, of the teaching priest is to guide your perceptions, to help you like a driver leading you, driving that vehicle. Something happens, the veil is torn, the scale falls from your eyes, and you are able to see like you'll be learning. The business of revelation is the business of sight. Beyond sound, Habakkuk said, I will stand upon my watch so that I will see, not just hear, I will see. You're going to pray, Lord, grant me the gift of perception, the gift of the seeing eyes. Go ahead and pray. Shala prasko vene kurasa na maldata sebra kebere tu skia, shabri kebere doko sobranda balako siada, krata savalanda brake barados kebere tu siada bash. The gift of sight, access to illumination in the spirit and by the spirit. Amen and amen. God bless you. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Please bless Pastor Petrock. He walked in. Um, it's good to see you, Pastor. Thank you. Pastor Petrock Sadiq. Hallelujah. Are you ready? The assignment of revelation is to bring forth transitions. Revelations stop you from remaining at a certain level and at a certain realm. Your transition in life and in the spirit is at the mercy of revelation revelations are like vehicles they move you from prophecy to manifestation hallelujah that means if you are bankrupt of revelation and i want you to listen carefully if you are bankrupt of light it will be impossible for you to move and to transit realms in the spirit it says but the people that sat in darkness have seen a great light the assignment of the teaching priest by the spirit of grace is to unravel the mysteries of the kingdom. Please listen. Paul was speaking in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, that grace and apostleship was given to him and that the character of that mandate was that everywhere he went to, he granted the people the ability to see. The ability to see. Media, can you help us? Ephesians 3 and verse 9. We're reading 9 and then 10. It says, and to make all men see. How many men? There is a grace that can make men see. It does not just tell you what to look at. It can do something, alter your perception, alter your understanding until you see. This is beyond secular enlightenment. It's a grace. That when you are under that grace, he can cause you to comprehend what God is saying. To make all men see. 
to make all men see. If God is saying he intends to lift you, there is a grace that makes you to see what it takes to align with that prophetic word. And so my encouragement for you is, do not see revelation just as an intelligent discussion from the Bible. No. Imagine yourself entering a vehicle, a chariot, that is about to transit you from your current version to another version, a more superior one, a more glorious one. You know how a snake, a reptile molds, leaving its former self behind. The new self that comes is bigger, larger, greater, more agile. That's what happens to you under the influence of the Spirit. This is beyond a lecture, you see. A lecture just stops at the realm of your mind and your thinking. But there is a grace component to everything you are hearing. It is that grace component that makes you become. Without the grace component, you will stop at the realm where the Bible says they are ever learning, but never coming into. You can learn, but the experience of it is not just a product of intelligence. There is a transition in the spirit. Hallelujah. And so I have a few thoughts that I'll be sharing with us. And I'm trusting and praying that God will open our eyes to see. In Jesus' name. Are you ready? Revelations chapter 4. <laughs> I love the word of God, my God. Revelations chapter 4. This morning, we'll be considering verse 1. Revelations chapter 4 and verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were the voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show you the things that must be hereafter. Hallelujah. I'd like us to read the first two words that you can see. Ready? First two words. One to go. Mm -mm. First two words. One to go. One more time. My question is, after what? Because the Bible begins by saying, after this. And if you're an intelligent person studying scripture, you don't just begin to study the story. What happened? He said, after this. That means you need the understanding of the this for what he's about to say to make sense of you. He says, after this, I looked. Very profound revelation. After this. When you study the book of Revelations, now it was at a time in church history where John, John was banished into an island called Patmos on account of his faith. Verse chapter 1 tells us, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Are we together? So whilst he was there, and by the way, I, I should do this. It's my, it's my auntie in this place. I need to give her that honor. Is she here? Please. Ah. I love you, Auntie. God bless you. Is she alone? Are you alone? Who else came? Ah, please. Can they rise? Let's just, let's just give them one big God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I just, I just remembered and I thought to do that. We're house of honor. Amen. So it says, after this, after chapter 1, after chapter 2, after chapter 3, and after chapter 4. So the Bible says that whilst he was in the Isle of Patmos, can you hear me? Are we still together? The Bible says something happened to him. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the moment he got in the Spirit, he began to have several encounters mighty encounters and he was instructed to write because those words were faithful and true. Are we together now? Now, did you know that the encounter in chapter 1 alone, if all you have in your Christian experience is chapter 1's encounter, that is enough to embolden and empower you because the book starts with the revelation of Jesus himself. So he sees seven lampstands 
and he says in the midst of the lampstand I saw one like the son of man and he begins to describe him profound description and out of that revelation came what we call the letter to the seven churches beginning from Ephesus and he ends with the seven church being Laodicea are we together now the church in Laodicea so he gave them profound commendations and rebukes as it were now you would think that John that was a heightened experience none of the apostles had the privilege of that kind of experience even though they walked with Jesus in the flesh no one was granted that opportunity to see him in glory in that form and that fashion and to begin to document profound mysteries warnings to the church that were in the then Asia Minor and then after such a spectacular encounter series of encounters the Bible now says after this so there was something left beyond seeing the lampstand there was something left beyond seeing the Son of Man there was something left I would think that if I saw Jesus I saw the glory of God and I'd received the commendations and warnings what else would be left the Bible says after this after this after the mighty things that God has done and is doing through your life after the expansion in ministry he says after this I still looked it takes stamina to look when there are good things behind you are we together now it is easier for someone who has failed or is a nobody to look that should be the obvious thing but not after great strides like this John was in the middle of a phenomenal time in his life as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible says after these spectacular experiences he said I still looked I hope you know his invitation only came because he looked so it was as though God was waiting to see if the experiences he had had so far would cause him to plateau would cause him to be contented would cause him to not want to press for more he says when I looked and I beheld there was a voice already waiting and says since you have now looked come are we together it takes focus it takes hunger it takes meekness to still look after this after you are called a man of God already accredited by signs and wonders after you are called a businessman already multi-millionaire businessman with your evidences after you are called a successful career person you see let me tell you the passion to become when you are not is almost natural because the awareness of your failure and limitations are enough motivation to want to get out of that place but by the time you have achieved a certain level of results the the passion to continue dies this is the deception of success we are not talking here about a man who is an unbeliever who just became a believer first that he was an apostle then called John the beloved a name that was not used for any other apostle including Paul John the beloved are we together now yes Jesus was so endeared to him he was one of the disciples that finished strong all other disciples ran away they never made it to the cross John was the one person who saw the crucified Christ even before he died you would think with all those kinds of ministerial credentials what else would John be looking for then the Bible says after this after healing all the sick after raising people from the wheelchairs after having such a name what is there to seek God for the Bible says after this I looked hmm. after this I looked when the Spirit of God opened my eyes to see this this message was first for me even before preparing it for you this is not a message for weak people this is a message for those who God has honored to a measure those who have tasted of great things already that's what is a believers meeting after this 
If you are not a champion, the message is not for you. It's a message for those who have triumphed to a measure. It is a, it is a secret for continuity. After this, I looked. Hmm. I looked and behold. Do you know the kind of focus it takes to look? Because when you have already arrived and attained a measure of results, usually there will be applause loud enough to distract you from going forward. That's why I said it takes hunger, it takes focus, it takes meekness to still look. What about the uploads of yesterday? You want me to ignore that? How about the obvious results that follow my life like a shadow? He says, after this. This is a prophetic message for someone. After your first prophecy, let's see what happens. After the first church was built. After the first million. After the first billion, he says, after this, it's a clarion call for champions. Men who have done much for the kingdom, and yet God is saying there is still another dimension. But he says, after this. So this morning, we are discussing this. After this has kept many people down, they stopped looking. They started looking to even get to that point. But they now made their past and their present become their future. There was nothing new again in their experience. So the Bible says, after this, I have seen the fruits of prayer, but after this, I have seen the excellence that comes with obeying God, but after this. Is someone learning now? It says, after this, I, as an act of my will, Conscious of the fact that a man can never plateau in God. If you are interested, there are always higher realms and dimensions. He says, after this, I looked. The question is, he never said, I looked towards. Because in looking, you first have to look away from before you look towards. Are we together? At every given point in time, your eye is focused on something. So if I have to look at you, my first assignment is to look away from here. Then I now look at what is now my current gaze. Moses was looking, but not at the burning bush. Help those under the anointing. Are we together now? So Moses, listen to me. When God wanted to get his attention for a new experience, I hope you know that even though he was called to be a deliverer and a prophet, Huh? When he ran away from Egypt, watch this now, something remarkable happened to him. For 40 years, he was now a successful shepherd. He was not a failure. With respect to that shepherd, you would call, he was, this guy was a businessman. He was doing well, yet he was even about to start. With respect to destiny, he had not started. It's amazing the things we keep celebrating yet in heaven. The first page has not even opened. So, if you had seen Moses 40 years after leaving Egypt, heaven is still saying, when will you start? Deliverer, you are still a shepherd. But he's saying, I'm a successful shepherd. I'm a successful shepherd. I mean, I have my evidences. My sheep is there. My ability to lead sheep is there. And one day, watch this. When God wanted him to rise to a new level, the Bible says there was a bush. That bush began to burn. The first thing God had to get was his sight. I want to explain to you what happened to John. After this, my eyes and my attention were somewhere focused on my success and my results of yesterday and for as long as I kept looking at it God was saying there is more I know that you are an intercessor but there is a prophetic dimension I know you are you are doing well as a pastor but that ministry would not just end pastoral there is a, a an apostolic dimension after this I looked Everything God gives you is not all he intends to give. God is always progressive. After this. So Moses is tending the sheep of Jethro. 
And the Bible says when it was time for God to get his attention, he created a scenario that was greater than what he had seen. And then Moses said that that scenario kept distracting him. For a while he was still looking at yesterday and today. Still trying to go into the future but he didn't want to leave yesterday. But one point the Bible says and Moses turned aside. And when God saw that he had turned aside, the voice just like in Revelation came again. And he says, Moses, now we can talk. I've gotten your attention. It seems to me like God does not talk to men till he finds out that their attention is focused on him. He will desire to speak, but he's patient enough to allow you until your current level stops distracting you and you can look beyond the success of today. After this, I looked. Moses was a great shepherd, but that prophetic dimension was not yet there. And the Bible says when he saw the bush, we don't know how long that bush was burning, but this morning there is a bush that is burning. And God is telling you, in as much as there are great things I've done with you, the page is not even open. I know you have seen Jesus. I know you have received messages to the seven churches, but this is only the beginning. After this, I looked. I know you have tasted of the power of God. You have seen the anointing of the Spirit. I know that you have seen success in life, in business, in career, perhaps in ministry. But the first message tonight is do you have the hunger enough do you have the courage enough? Do you have the discernment enough to love your tomorrow more than your today? Can you look away from great things? Can you look away from the applauds and the successes and focus on what God intends to do now? After this, I looked. You've been at the United Kingdom for years and in all fairness to you, God has been faithful. Good house, good children, great news. This message is for you. After these, can you look? Can you still look that there is a purpose beyond having a house and having an MSc or a PhD? What did God tell you before he sent you? It was not an academic issue. Academic was just a vehicle. Now you are done. You are successful. You are working. But after this, he says, I looked. Please give him volume. Hallelujah. In Philippians chapter 3 from verse 13 and 14. Help me again media. Philippians 3. Let's work together. 13 and 14. Philippians chapter 3. 13 and 14. Paul made a very profound statement that I want us to pay attention to. Let me show you a man who has mastered the art of defeating the successes of the current level and striving for higher realms. He says, brethren, I count myself to not have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind. He never said forgetting the failures. No, no. Failures are not the only thing you are supposed to forget. There are many good things that can keep you in your yesterday and you may never experience the other sides of God. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to the things which are before, verse 14. I like the first two words. He says, I press. It's an act of my will. I press. Motivated or otherwise, I press. He says, I press towards the mark. No, this cannot be the greatest of the prophetic. This cannot be the greatest of the apostolic. Thank God for yesterday. This cannot be the greatest of koinonia. This cannot be the greatest of my finances, my business. I press. Brethren, I count myself. You may count me a great man of God. You may count me a great businessman. But I count myself. It's not condemnation. It's the passion to continue. The passion to remain grateful for what you count me as but I count myself to not have apprehended 
but this one thing. I may not know how to do other things, but there is one thing I've mastered. The art of defeating my successes of yesterday. Failure can kill as much as success. Failure can limit as much as success. This one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, This one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind. I want to show you what kills champions. I want to show you why people do not remain. I want to show you why people are warriors and giants and champions today and they fall like a pack of cards. They have not mastered this thing Paul mastered. I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I press, I press. I press, I press towards successful yesterday but I still press, successful today but I still press. Please sit down, please sit down. We're still discussing verse 1, come up hither. So the Bible tells us, do you know? Every major version, Amplified, New International Version, New King James, they did not change this statement. All of them start by saying, after this. Regardless of the translations, the Spirit of God saw the need to preserve those two words. When I began to study this, I stayed in these two words for more than one week. After this. <laughs> The more successful you are, the longer you will stay on that scripture because your these are many. They represent crowns. They represent accomplishments. They represent achievements after this. That means the preceding expressions will not profit you till you meditate on this after this. More love, more power, more of you in my life. Listen, there is a reason why many people never do so much with God. There is a reason why many people rise to a level, whether in ministry or in business or in career, and then they plateau. Only to speak about the miracles and the mighty things of yesterday. I want to hand to you this morning a secret. A powerful secret. Are we together now? It takes focus. It takes hunger. It takes passion to still be doing well. To still be making progress. To still be receiving the applause. And the louder the applaud comes, the more you do not let it distract you. It says, after this, some of you were looking well. Your gaze was intact until men began to clap. Their applause became louder than his voice. It so distracted you. Right now, you do not even know your true north, where that bearing is again. After this, after the one million came, after I moved to UK, for some, I stopped looking. I looked before getting the visa. Because that, it made me fast. It made me pray. I mean, I had a, something driving me. But after this, I looked. The Bible tells us that the door was opened and the voice came. It did not come just as a gift. It came as a reward because God was watching. Chapter 1 watching chapter 2 watching chapter 3 watching you mean in spite of the fact that you have been given the privilege to document this your focus is not distracted in spite of the fact that even if we were to stop here you would still be a champion as an apostle he says after this I looked and because he looked and beheld a door was opened in heaven. Where was he before? So even in heaven, there is still room for more. You would think because he was already there, 
that meant all he saw was all there was to be seen he says i looked and the first voice which i heard was as a voice of the trumpet talking with me and he said this in honor to my passion in honor to my hunger in honor to my press he says i see a desire in you to last i see a desire in you to remain i have studied the way you do ministry and i see that you intend to remain even after 30 years you intend to remain in business you intend to be a leader in your field therefore come up hither it's a call come up hither there are things i will show you but the requirement is that i must probe your hunger i must probe your thirst i must probe your passion can i tell you God is glorious, God is loving, but he is not foolish. He draws men according to his perception of their hunger, their passion for him. You would think just because he loved you and died for you, he will give you everything, grant you access to any realm. No, not everything in the kingdom is a gift. There are dimensions that are rewards. And for you to qualify there, God studies hunger. Hunger is a powerful component in the believer's work. Hunger is proof of health. When people become sick, the first thing they lose is appetite. Medical practitioners are here and they use appetite, the lack of it sometimes to confirm that this man is sick truly. Because all men who are well should be hungry and should be thirsty. Hallelujah. Are we together? So come up hither is a journey into higher realms of authority and power. Come up hither is not just a statement, it's an initiation. God is calling you to tell you there are higher realms of power, there are higher realms of authority and that he wants to bring you into but you have to see there must be that desire my god moses never knew that the rod he was holding could become the rod of god one day that that rod could part the red sea had he tried it at that point that version of him could not perform that miracle only god knows what else your hands can do only god knows what else your mind can do only god knows what else your organization can do but that version of you, that version of consciousness and understanding cannot go that far. So he said, come up hither. Come up hither. Come up hither. Why is he asking you to come up hither? Because there are things that need to be altered as far as your perception is concerned. Come up hither is a journey into higher realms of revelation is altering your sight is the business of sight come up here and I will show you not I will tell you there are things you need to see you can doubt what you hear but you cannot doubt what you see there are times you pick a call and maybe because of some network challenge you, you can you need to verify who is speaking and the person almost gets angry and say you've forgotten my voice but not when you are seeing you cannot look at someone and say are you the one you see that now Sight is more powerful than sound because it creates greater conviction. Come up hither and I will show you. Is God speaking to someone? So it is a journey to higher levels of authority and power and that happens by higher levels of illumination and revelation. Let me tell you the truth. The whole journey of come up hither is a business of consciousness and revelation. Come up here is because God wants to do something to your consciousness, your understanding, the revelation of the Spirit at work in your life. Because you see, authority in this kingdom is a measure of the light that you have and that you have received. I don't want to go ahead of myself, but when you go to chapter 5, the worship of the Lamb by the 20 and 4 elders, the Bible says, I wept. For no man was worthy to open the book and unlock the scroll. Is that right? Then the Bible says, the elder tapped me and he said, Weep not, for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is worthy to open the book. He now said, I saw, I looked on the throne and I saw a lamb as though had been slain, having seven eyes 
and seven horns. Take note of that statement. Seven eyes and seven horns. The eye represents light and revelation. The horns represent authority. So for every dimension of authority, there is a light component that connects to it. Seven eyes and seven horns. Seven eyes and seven horns. You don't step into that zone of authority until you have the light component. I have seen this in my visions many times. And so I know, not just by scripture, it has become my experience. You are empowered by light. You cannot demonstrate authority beyond your level of light. Your authority is at the mercy of your spiritual understanding. When God wants to expand your reach in terms of exercising authority, what happens is that he opens your consciousness by revelation to higher truths, deeper dimensions. And this is what God has called us to experience even this morning. Is someone changing? Hmm. So the whole journey of come up hither is a journey of revelation and alter, an alteration to your consciousness. Revelations 4 verse 1, it says, Come up hither and I will show you. Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. I want to show you a few scriptures. 5 verse 1, media. Let's walk together. We'll look at verse 1 and then verse 6. It says, and I saw. Somebody say, and I saw. Are you seeing that? It's a the, is the whole business of sight, seeing. Go to verse 6, please. Revelations 5 and verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of this, I saw. I beheld, I saw. I beheld, I saw. I beheld, I saw. In fact, let me give you one more scripture. Revelations um, chapter 6. Let's look at verse 1, verse 3, and verse 5. All of them will say, come and see. Mm. Come. If you come up here, it is so that you can see. One of the four elders said, verse 1, come and see. Verse 3, come and see. Verse 5, come and see. So when he calls you, it's not just come and watch. It's not just come and roam around. He's calling you so that you can come and see. Call on to me and he says, I will answer. Is that in your Bible? I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So the way to knowledge is to show you. When you see it, you can have that knowledge. Come on to me and I will answer. I will show you. The, my cure to your ignorance is your sight. Show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Your knowledge is at the mercy of what you see. When God wants to correct a man's ignorance and take away spiritual limitation from your life, he gives you a higher perception of spiritual things. Let me tell you the truth. There is something God can show you about finances that will make it look like you are holding a charm. You will conquer finances in this realm in a way that surprises you. There is something God can show you about the healing ministry and you will command tremendous power. It's not just an impartation. It's a product of light. Most times we just seek impartations. You see, impartation is like fuel in a car. The fuel does not drive the car. Are we together now? You still need a driver. Revelation is that driver. The driver without the fuel will not be able to move. But you just carry gas, a jerry can say of gas, and just put it in the car. You're not going anywhere without a good driver. It doesn't matter even if it's a new car. Revelation is that driver. It creates transitions. The value of the anointing is that it comes upon an individual who is transformed by light. You see the potential of impartation when transformation by light has happened. Are we together now? When the vessel is small, it makes the oil small. You will blame the oil but the oil has potential to assume the shape of any vessel given to it. The prophet said the problem is that the vessel is small. He says go and borrow vessels. Borrow not a few. Hallelujah. When I began my work with the Lord, the Lord insisted upon my life that I focus on revelation. You will be surprised 
that those who really walk in power do not focus so much about power because power is the end product of something it's an equation something plus something plus something equals power are we together now yes there is a light component you must have look at me every area of darkness in your life today I am telling you not just by prophecy is at the mercy of higher levels of revelation and you may have held certain truth <laughs> do you know sometimes I laugh at myself because I'm one person who has seen the power of God in my life in a very humbling way but I look at my former self now and sometimes I'm tempted to laugh amazing how many things I did not know about the anointing if you saw me then you would think that because of what you were seeing, I knew everything about the anointing. I'm looking at my former self now, even as I'm talking, and I'm laughing at my former self. My God, look the gap in knowledge. Are we learning? It is amazing how many things we do not know enough of. And you see, when it has to do with results in the kingdom, you are not at liberty to choose the level of knowledge you want. There is a requisite level of knowledge enough to command certain results. I think it's 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Please give it to us. Let's try it. Is God helping someone? 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2. Let's read it together if you see it projected. I want you to read it as loud and as clear as you can. Ready? One, two, read. Uh huh. One more time, please. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he says he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to. Hmm. As he ought to. I think I've, I've, I've given this illustration here where you find a student who's course F, students who have the grade F. F does not necessarily mean zero. F means anything less than 40. Am I right on that? So the student who did not sit for the examination, the one who got 10%, 20%, even 39%, they all failed. And yet, the one who scored 39% performed better than the one who scored 10, but they still failed. This is the deception of limited knowledge. You will look and compare yourself and say at least... I know better than this but based on that grade level you are all at the same experience so if you say all those who scored above 30 percent someone will stand proudly and say at least sorry for you who scored one two or you who did not sit for the exam but when we say those who scored F all of you stand up to his surprise they will all be in the same group it is amazing how many things we brag about, but the realm of the spirit groups us in one place. <laughs> See that? I've been in ministry for 10, 15 years, and the realm of the spirit says, that's good. But here is the realm of those who do not know enough. This is where they stay. So the experience of the one who does not know God and the one who is so limited, it becomes the same. Because an heir, for as long as he's a child, he differed not. No distinguishing factor from a slave even though he be lord of all it is amazing how many things ladies and gentlemen god wants to bring us into but because of limited spiritual knowledge what do you not know yet about satan what do you not know yet about god's power what do you not know yet about favor did you know that once upon a time in my life i would only talk about favor like a discussion somewhere but i saw people who embodied this thing and i said no the Lord, the same Lord is rich unto all. You see, I had to take responsibility to say there is something I have not seen. I tell you the truth, everything that works for anyone can work for you, but not under every condition. There is a light requirement. Hmm. Come up, Gida. Rise from your current level spiritually man of God rise woman of God rise are we together yes oh apostle but I'm a great prophet to what accuracy two over ten are we together now 
you are a wonderful lady you prophesied to 10 people eight were wrong congratulations for the two you got right but that is not you will not take the nations that way not with that margin of error there is need to rise oh I'm walking in the healing anointing what are the testimonies honestly not stage money genuine healings two people out of how many in that place if you heal two out of every ten is that enough to call it a healing ministry you should be grateful but not contented not like no 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 you should be angry a holy dissatisfaction the Bible says handkerchiefs and aprons were taken from the body of an apostle same Lord same grace same blood that you receive what has changed now why can we not we not enter their experience you know most times we talk about so many things in the Bible sometimes I feel uh, not condemnation but sincerely I feel guilty as a preacher when I'm reading certain things I'm almost tempted to close it and say God what is wrong with us what is wrong with us how do you feel comfortable reading this my God there were men who were like gods in the Bible if you saw Samuel your life would have to change he was called a seer just by seeing him what is missing returns back home he has not prayed oh you just encountered him how about Moses the nation of Israel as soon as they saw him the light they said no 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 he did not even know his face was shining that's what the glory of God can do these were not parables it's in your Bible Jesus will heal people and beg them not to announce it they were too grateful to keep quiet how about women who encountered him once left their water pots left everything and ran to a city when was the last time that happened you encountered many people they argued with you they almost injured you you had to leave yet it's the same God you were trying to talk about how about prophets who said by this time tomorrow how many times have we said by this time tomorrow by this time next week by this time one month and nothing happened come up here that is a journey to perfection it's a journey to maturity it's a journey to command of authentic power and grace that you can demonstrate God to a generation my God I read about these ones we call God's generals and you know we talk a lot about them but let me tell you sincerely without any condemnation we do not come close to even those who clean those churches those days I've had the honor of watching some of their videos. I've had the honor of listening to a few people who were at their meetings. History and media did not do justice in capturing the extent of the God life that flowed through them. Email. Email. Help me. Email, email, is Listen, we've been shouting forever that the wealth of the wicked is laid for the righteous. There are few people, the testimonies are so scanty, it looks like a lie. We have said this thing for a long time. I'm part of those who have said it that there are men who will handle the wealth of nations. And yet the unbelievers, we keep saying money will flow to them. They look at us with pity. Then later we beg them, say, help me while I'm trying to get this thing. Something is wrong with our understanding. I'm not being sarcastic. It's a prophetic convergence. The goal is to plant a holy hunger and anger within you. Something is wrong. We're not getting something right. Are we together? There's something we're not getting right. And let me tell you, if you continue doing church that way, very soon our pews will be empty. Because people are looking for God. They want to see the grace, the power of God. Are we together? They want to see a God that answers prayer. They want to see a God whose love can be proven in the world of men. They want to see a God whose mercy, when you say he's a lifter, show he's a lifter. When you say he can turn lives around, show he can turn lives around. When you say he heals, let the sick be the one to testify that he healed me. 
there are results that are too notable to be manipulated too notable to be faked are we together now thank God for all these small healings not not to demean them it's all the power of God but it's not notable enough How many believers have prospered in the UK the way the Bible says should happen? We keep saying we have the power to get wealth. We keep saying the favor of God is on us. And the Bible has left us exceeding great and precious promises. Now there are unbelievers who are looking. Okay, let me study from afar. Let me see a demonstration of God's faithfulness in the life of this person. Yes, you can serve God in spite of. But how about serving God in the midst of? You can serve God in the midst of blessings. Are we together now? Away with that mentality that your increase and prosperity is dangerous. It's, it's ignorance. The holiest person on earth, the holiest person in our, uh, God himself is still the wealthiest person. It did not affect his holiness. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. The very earth there, all this argument about land, the real owner is the epitome of holiness. Many of you here right now, if I ask you to write your request like I'll be asking you in the evening, most of it will be housing issues. Am I right on that? Or some kind of bill. Some of you, whilst you are seated here, you love Jesus with all your heart. But you would be a better believer if certain things were sorted. You would be a better witness of his faithfulness if certain things were sorted. It's the reason why we celebrate testimonies when we hear them. First, because we glorify God, but it also connects to what we truly desire. God, this is what I want to. This is what I'm trusting you to do to. Hallelujah. T.L. Osborne, when he began his ministry, he just began by talking about a God he did not know. He went to India and he was disappointed. Nobody listened to him. A few tragedies happened in his life that caused him to go back and seek God to get authentic power to be a witness. He returned back to you, to India and the same deafness they gave to his, to his word. He got angry and he called, I was told, several sick people right in the presence of everyone. When miracles began to erupt, let me tell you this. When you see a genuine manifestation of the hand of God, no matter how hardened you are, something will happen to you. Even if you choose to live in denial, you will never be the same. If you actually see God display his power in the midst of men, it becomes too notable. You may argue it and pretend it like the scribes and the Pharisees, but you will go back home with conviction. I saw it. It is truly God. This kind of testimony, men cannot produce it. This kind of change of story, man cannot do this. That a sister came here and by evening, someone called you and said, God told me to give you a house. How do you say that is coincidence? Are we together now? I'll take care of your children all through to college. Diagnosed of stage four cancer with the medical reports and both you and the doctor who treated you are in the service and he's watching your other report. Come on now. We rob God from being glorified when we do not grow, when we do not rise, when we do not contend, when we keep talking, proposing a God to the nations whose power and ability and wisdom we cannot defend. Let me tell you this. This generation that God has placed us now is not a generation of blind loyalty. You are going to have to give an evidence. There is a generation that has been distracted away from God through technology, through the reality of the times that we live in, you want to call their attention, it's not going to be by blind loyalty. You will waste your time for nothing. It is the reason why our churches continue to get emptier and emptier. Do you know why? There are enough people to fill them, but the evidence to bring them there is not there. And if you do not have the evidence, you are not a witness. What makes a witness a witness is that he has a token of truthfulness called evidence. I was blessed listening to the testimonies. The dear lady who came sharing her testimony and while I sat there, I said, God, these are the kinds of things we want to see. Spectacular manifestations of his grace. Beyond falling down and standing up, beyond shouting in church, 
when we shout in church, we are the only ones who know what we are doing. Now, I'm not, I'm not downplaying it, but I mean, who cares? Translate the God life to a context that will silence the arguments of men. Silence the arguments of men. That you stood before all men and said, the God I serve lived. They will laugh at you and mock at you. Let them find a reason to say, I'm sorry. Because God will sign something upon your life. And someone will come to you to say, listen, this is the kind of God I want to follow. We are selling a Jesus to our nations they are not interested in. Because our testimony about him makes him look fake. Our testimony about him makes social media look better than him. If I can create an app or I can send something about my product and with one click it goes around the world and you are telling me love him, serve him because you love him but then that he can lift you and you claim to have placed favor on my head and I do not see any... No. When a herbalist does something to you, you will see the result. This is somebody you believe is not of God, you believe is of the devil and yet he gives you all kinds of rubbish, tie this, do this, drink this, do that. And then in the midst of it, as ugly as it looks, you will be surprised that the destiny helper just shows up from somewhere and says, I don't even know what I'm doing here. But you know what brought him. Come up here. Come up here. Preachers, come up here. Businessmen, come up here. That in one year, you start a business and in that one year, listen, I, I'm not, I, I believe in process. I don't believe in get rich quick, but I also don't believe in get rich slow. No, I don't. I don't. Unapologetically so. Don't think I'm going to say I'm sorry. Not at all. Do you know why? Because the purpose of wealth is to serve the program of God. And you need time to serve the program of God. And if that whole time is spent trying to get your needs met, it's an attack. That's not how it was supposed to work. You believe me on this. It's an attack. Hallelujah. So the call, come up hither, is a proposal from God to begin a journey with Him. A journey that makes your Christian experience always effective. An experience with God that turns you like we shared the last time during our retreat for the workers, a sign and a wonder. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, no matter how we shout revival, we brag revival, we discuss revival, the world will keep looking at us making a jest of ourselves in church until we can import the God life to a context that rattles our civilization as we know it. Three Hebrew boys, they didn't talk revival, but they caused revival. They entered the fire and in 24 hours, or less than that, they brought great glory to the name of the Lord. Today we shout revival, we write books about it, but nothing happens that looks like it. Because it was not supposed to be a discussion, it was a demonstration. A demonstration of men who have found God, found God genuinely, enough to use the power that has come from that encounter to influence their world. But let me tell you, in the name of Jesus, the body of Christ is rising. Even the body of Christ in Europe is rising. I was reading a few statistics about the church in Europe and with all due respect, it broke my heart. It really broke my heart. It broke my heart. The decline in terms of passion for God, the decline in terms of church attendance, the decline in the interest of people even to get into ministry because they have so failed in ministry. They failed carrying the name of Jesus on their heads and the world told them, go back. Go and know the Jesus. Unbelievers recommended that they needed encounters. They said, we don't believe in Jesus, but this one is not the one you are talking about. Hallelujah. This morning, I want to give you three keys. Keep these keys and you will find yourself walking in profound dimensions of the God life. These keys have come from my study of scripture, my study of men and women by the grace of God who have done much and are doing much for the kingdom. And they have also come by the privilege of the bit that God has helped us to see in this spiritual journey. Is someone ready to learn? Hmm. I want to show you by the spirit 
three hindrances that can stop you from coming up hither. The hindrances, three of them, that can stop you from attaining the reality of the life and the power of God. If you avoid these three keys, I tell you, regardless what level you are in now, spiritually and otherwise, you will transit in the spirit faster than you ever imagined. You will step into realms of the anointing. You will step into realms of power, realms of wisdom, realms of grace. You believe that? Shout a loud amen. amen. Pray in the spirit for one minute and then we'll discuss this very briefly. Mm. Come up hither. A journey to higher levels, deeper dimensions in the spirit. I believe, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up exalted I receive I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations See Jesus lifted up, glorified. Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Number one, the first hindrance to rising to a higher dimension in the spirit, the first hindrance that will stop you from coming up hither by the spirit of God is called disinterest towards God and spiritual things. Disinterest towards God. Disinterest towards God and spiritual things. There are men and women who will never rise to superior dimensions in the spirit. Not because of an attack from Satan. There is a determination from them as an act of their will that I'm not interested in God and I'm not interested in the things of the spirit. I have met people that way. They have met me, they have listened to my messages and you would think they would be so transformed. I have met people who as an act of their will, they have made up their mind as a commitment that they will not be serious with God. Disinterest completely towards God and towards spiritual things. Disinterest towards prayer. Disinterest towards the ministry of the word. Disinterest towards church. Have you, have you met people like that? No matter how spectacular you share your testimony, they will watch this way. It's not an attack. They just as an act of their will, they have not seen the relevance of God nor spiritual things in their lives. There is no coming up higher for such a person. As much as God is wonderful and merciful and compassionate, he allows men to show their interest, then he brings you. I looked and then he said, come up here. This interest towards God. When you really want to help a man to do business with God, you have to pray for grace for that person to as an act of his or her will find interest in the things of God. Are we together now? There are people who are not interested in anything prayer. They are not interested in anything word study. They are not interested in anything spiritual development. They would argue and argue and say to what end? They would listen to a message like this and all they can find, oh, well, he's a nice man. I like the way he speaks and wow. See the people saying amen. What? Nice people. I think if people are like this, our society will be better. That's all you got from this? This interest. As funny as that sounds, there are people even in your region like that. Their issue is not ignorance. They have access to anybody who can help them. They are just not interested. There are children like that. There are parents like that. 
their children are prayer warriors, fasting giants, apostles and prophets, and yet the father or the mother, they can say, wow, I hear that um, you are doing well. In fact, I hear right now that you bought a church building. Thumbs up, you are my son. And yet the man will never be changed by his son, Simon. It's not an attack. He will even advise you and say, let me advise you. Do ministry well. Make sure you love God. You have one building now. Make sure you consider expansion. I think that's a good idea. This is the man advising you. You say, can I pray no, that, that, that prayer thing? Don't worry, I'm okay. I'm fine all by myself. And you see, because God gave men a will, he will respect you, even at the detriment of your efficiency in the spirit. Are we together? God cannot help a man beyond his level of interest for spiritual things. The Bible says to be spiritually minded is life, but to be carnally minded is death. Even if you do not have the power to sponsor that transition, your willingness to want God, your willingness to love God, your willingness to love his house, his word, prayer, your willingness to love the realm where you stand in the anointing, being a blessing to people, that's enough. But if God does not find that willingness, believe me, you will not go far with him. This interest in spiritual things. Some of you, when you came to UK here, you what as an act of your will. You began to prioritize a lot of things and God was not part of it. And for some, sadly, God is still not part of it. You like the idea of God. In fact, one of your plans is to build an auditorium like this so that you can help churches. But your passion for God, you're not interested. It's time for everything. Come up hither. It's a call to use the gift of your will to say, I need you. I need you. <laughs> I need you. I don't know my way around this spiritual, this, this jungle of the realm of the spirit, but Lord, I need you. The Bible says the Lord is nigh them that call upon him. Not them who assume he's there them that call upon him you must declare your interest for someone you came for service this morning and the Lord is saying I am ready to help you if you are willing 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 complete disinterest it is true that the prophetic is in your destiny the apostolic the pastoral the healing ministry kingdom financing all of this is true but are you interested in God enough? Are we together now? Are you interested in Him enough? Is prayer a distraction to you or you perceive it to be a distraction? The study of the word? How about the house of God? There are many people who have not learned the value of the house of God. When the psalmist said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper. How can a man who is a king, what is in the house of God that is not in his palace? That man's palace was made of gold. And yet he said, I will give that up to be in his presence. That means there must be something in his presence that gold cannot give. There must be something in his presence silver cannot give. There must be something in his presence employment cannot give. Don't reduce God to an employment letter. Don't reduce God to just a coin, silver. He gives all this, but he's more than that. Is someone learning the value of his presence? To a point that Moses, now a prophet and a deliverer, would say, if your presence would not go with us, do not send us from here. The man was willing to assume the position of delay, provided God's presence will not go. How can a man prefer delay? I'd rather be here in the UK and not have a house, not have a car, if your presence will not go with me. A man can choose that. That means there's something about his presence you must learn. Hallelujah. This interest for the things of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 4. Let's hurry up so we can wrap up this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 to 4. I'm showing you the first hindrance. He said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Verse 2. It says, for men shall be lovers of their own self. Does that look like today? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, uh -huh. without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, 
incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Final verse, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. They would give up God a thousand times to embrace pleasure. Is someone learning? As you are listening to me, allow the Spirit of God that there is a circumcision that is happening within your heart and don't fight it. That circumcision, that, that cutting away is bringing you to a higher level in the Spirit. There are things God cannot do with you with your current version. Disinterest. For someone you came this morning and your cry should be walk on my heart. My passion has died. Walk on my heart, oh God. I don't know what happened. It didn't used to be like this before I came to the United Kingdom. Or it didn't used to be like this before I got a job. It didn't used to be like this before I got married, before I got children. Now the vicissitudes of life have eroded away my passion for the things of God. There needs to be a restoration. It's an emergency case. Are we together? Because I can tell you, everything you hold on to, that God is not the one holding on to, you will lose it. And you believe me, I don't know everything, but I've sojourned this life a bit to know that it is vanity to hold anything God is not holding. Eventually, you will find out that it will evaporate like a vapor in one moment. I have seen the influence of many diminish overnight. I've seen the wealth of many diminish overnight. I've seen governments change and with one policy, millionaires became paupers overnight. It is only what God keeps that is really kept. Nobody can keep anything God has not kept. Listen, my dear people, listen to me. I want you to cultivate a hunger and a passion for God that as an act of your will, you will make up your mind that from this session, I'm ready to come up hither. Ready. I am ready, ready with my life, that everything you have designed for me, I'm ready to become it, but that would be at the mercy of your interest, that Lord, whatever it takes to find my prayer life back to life, my word study life, my passion for the house of God, tired of giving excuses that is because I'm a mother, tired of giving excuses that is because now I have children, tired of saying I'm living far away, it's a lie. Everybody has time for what you place value on. Did you hear what I said? There are many people who would not go to the house of God, but you call them and say, I have a check of 10,000 pounds. Where are you? I'm at the other end of London. Can you come? I'm coming right away. I've searched my life. And I pray to God every time, I'm even while I'm standing here, that if there is anything that can take his place in my life, may he never give me. No, 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 you know, I've said amen many times. Amen with tears in my eyes. Believe me. You see, when you see God using people in spectacular ways, it's more than an impartation. It's more than good preaching. It's more than Greek and Hebrew. You can shout all you can. There is a presence factor that only your hunger. You see, <laughs> no. the nations will not listen to you just because you have something to say. Our world is full of eloquent men. Our world is full of wise men. Our world is full of technocrats, intelligent men who have stretched their mental faculty border to border. When I had an invitation to come to Harvard and deliver a lecture, I went to God in prayer and I said, Lord, I'm not a lecturer. I'm not an, academ I'm an, an academician. Why did you do this? Because I know that everything God does, there is purpose behind it. And God said, I'm fulfilling something that I told you that if you will let men see me, there is nothing I will not give you. And if that is done in the religious world alone, it will look like the bias of spirituality. But if that happens within a secular institution, now those professors are not fools. This is Harvard. And when God brought glory to his name, I returned back. And I remember this. 
after this, I looked. <laughs> after this. No, I don't look behind for too long. Thank you. Well done. After this, I looked. After the sound of revival, great things that God did. My goodness, my phone was full of text messages and, you know, all kinds of things. I remember preparing to go back. The night I would leave UK, I got down my knees and I said, oh God, show me mercy. Let the foolishness that has destroyed great men not catch up with me. After this, I looked. Now we're preparing for sound of revival, US, UK, and in the midst of the wonderful things happening, Canada, all of these places. And sometimes, you know, people sincerely send wonderful commendations. But after this, I looked. After this, anything that happens in time is not worth your distraction. Rejoice over it. But after this. I remember a gentleman who flew all the way from the US. Had been mightily impacted. And this gentleman came in to come and sow a seed. Met, I think we met in Ghana. And then I prayed for him. He returned back and God opened up his, you know, his financial destiny. This gentleman was making five figures every month doing very well and he decided it took was it a hundred thousand dollars or something of that sort just to come and sow into my life and when he came down to Nigeria I met him and when he was saying all those things he first did a video and gave our people to show me and then when he came I looked at him it was such a spectacular testimony and as I looked at him the Lord told me he said that money is not your own tell him to go back to US with it and sow it into the Koinonia account there in US for the conference yes sir what do I have that did not come from you and then when I was done it was such a great testimony it's a good thing as a leader to teach people and see them become that is your pride but after this I looked after tonight we wrap up this session we have our session with the workers but after that even after God does the great things that you'll be doing here in the UK in months to come, believe me, you've not seen anything like it. You, if you think you saw his hand last year, watch what he's going to do this year. Yeah. Because the Bible says they go from strength to strength. You will see his hand in spectacular ways. Look forward to the sound of revival. Hallelujah. But even after this, we will still look. Away from this, but towards him. Because before this came, he was, he still is. So when we look at this for a while, and once it is done, we take our gaze immediately. Let the world keep doing the clapping. But we set our gaze. It's a big secret. I'm showing you hindrances. Disinterest. Perhaps you are in this place and you were just invited because you were told, you know, Sincerely, it was just supposed to be a session with the workers. But I decided that, look, let's just open it up. And that's why we decided to limit all of this. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the reason why you see that we restricted a lot of things, you know, because we didn't want people beyond the space and then to have any chaos here. After this, If you can look beyond everything around your life, good or bad, then you are ready to continue with God. When bad things happen, you learn from them and you keep looking. When great things happen, you use them to be encouraged, but you keep looking. That way you have mastered continuity. That after 10 years, you will still be standing. And when people say, what is your secret? You say it's because I've learned how to look. When I cry, I still look. When I laugh, I still look. My feelings, my victories, my crowns, all my scars do not stop me from looking. Are we together now? Let me wrap up. So number one, disinterest for the things of God. Can I give you number two and three? Number two, someone is learning. 
I wish I had all night to discuss this. The state of your heart. The second hindrance, in fact, you can call it the corruption of the heart. The second hindrance to men experiencing God at a higher level is the state of your heart. The corruption of the state of a man's heart. Jeremiah chapter 9 from verse, um, okay, Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says, the heart of man is deceptive and it is desperately wicked. It says, who above all, who can know it? Then verse 10 says, I the Lord, I search the heart. Watch this. I try the reins to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his findings. Can you imagine this? Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Psalm 24. Spirit, have your way in us today. Spirit, take your place as we are changed. Spirit, have your way in us today. Spirit, take your place as we are changed forevermore. Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Is a hill in the spirit. These are the requirements. Or who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4. He that hath clean hands. He that hath a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Let me tell you the truth. In my walk with God, and believe me, I'm a student of revival. I have studied the moves of God. The greatest requirement to being used by God is the purity of your heart. Beyond your prayer life, beyond your fasting, beyond your word study, as important as they are, the state of your heart vetoes every other spiritual activity. You can fast all you can with a corrupted heart. You only wasted your time. You can pray all you can. That's, that cry of the psalmist, purify my heart. I've done a teaching on that. You can go to Koinonia Global and get it. Purify my heart. Hallelujah. You can do many correct things, but not with a perfect heart. Like Amaziah. He did what was right in the sight of God, but not with a perfect heart. A pure heart. The state of your heart. Write this for reference. In 2 Kings chapter 4, the full text is from verse 8 to 31. But for sake of time, I would just... Just let you have the rendition so that you learn. So the Bible talks about the woman in Shunem, the Shunammite woman, that she had a child by the word of the prophet Elisha. And then in the course of time, the child became sick and the father sent that the mother would come and nurse the child. And while he was on her lap, the child died. The Bible says the woman got her donkeys and was on her way to meet Elisha. And when she met Elisha, Gehazi met Elisha sent Gehazi to meet her on the way and he asked, are you fine? Is everything well? And she said, I'm fine. When she met the prophet, she said, I didn't ask you for a child. It was of your making. You said you would pray for me to have a child. Now the child is dead. I've come to you. And do you know what happened? Elisha gave Gehazi his rod and said, go with it at once. Don't be so distracted to greet anybody. If anyone greets you, don't even respond and go and lay that rod on the child and the child will come back to life and so Gehazi went ahead and the woman said I'm not leaving you I don't trust this your man and so he prevailed she prevailed upon him and he was going with her but Gehazi had gone ahead of them the Bible says when Gehazi went he met the child dead and he placed the rod what happened the correct rod by the correct prophet and yet it did not come back to life. Because what powers the rod is the state of your heart. 
the state of your heart is that battery. Like you have a clock and there is a battery behind it. You can buy a new clock. If that battery is not there, it will not work. The state of your heart. There are many people who have received impartations, oil upon oil, mantle upon mantle, but it fell dead upon a corrupted heart. Are we together? It is not just about receiving. It is about the purity of your heart. What makes your heart pure? I will tell you. The desire in your heart to see God glorified beyond making a name for yourself. That's what makes your heart pure. The moment you get to a point in your life where your entire life is all about giving God glory, like we say in Koinonia, Jesus revealed, Jesus glorified. Everything about your life is one of the biggest secrets of the life of this man standing before you. It is not necessarily because I prayed the most, fasted the most, studied the most. No. There is something about God finding a heart that is sincere towards him. That you sincerely desire to see him glorified. That was a prayer I prayed before I left coming here. I said, Lord, I'm on my way going again. The mission remains the same. To see Jesus glorified. People will clap. They will say apostle and this, but they glorify him. I will tell you this. Once you do not walk on your heart, there are things God cannot trust you with. He cannot trust you with people. He cannot trust you with resources. He cannot trust you with opportunities. You know why? The answer is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8. When you read from verse 11 to 17. Lest your heart be lifted up. In the presence of abundance, achievements, accomplishments. You tell yourself, my power and the might of my hand has given me this. There are many preachers who are great. But cannot be used by God beyond certain things. Do you know why? Because somewhere locked up in our hearts, that desire for a name, that desire for fame, and it's a temptation that befalls all men. You must resist it. Resist it. Are we together now? There are business people who cannot be used by God because the day you make your first million dollars, ten million dollars, hundred million dollars, my goodness, God will have to queue to listen to you too. I mean God, he will come and join the queue and you say, I'm busy. Who are you? King of kings, it doesn't matter. You just join the queue. Ah. Till the nations. Now you understand the song. Till the nations see Jesus. Till the nations see Jesus. Lifted up, glorified. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, glorified. When your desire for power becomes as a tool to help the nation see Jesus, then you are ready for authentic, genuine power. When your desire for wealth is not just to flash designers and say, I am this and that and that. No, that's too small a reason. God's program is bigger than just having a good dress. Nothing wrong with that. But if that is the circumference of your pursuit, you're wasting your time. As far as doing business with God is concerned, forever Koinonia will live to sing his praises and to let the nation see him. I tell you, it's an intentional project to discourage anything that would just lead to the promotion of self. Thank God for Joshua Selman. But with or without me, God's program can happen. It's an honor to be part of his program. Listen very carefully. As God lifts you, you must be careful. People can clap you to your downfall. And when you fall, they will say, come and see him. We said it. The state of your heart a broken and a contrite heart a broken and a contrite heart a heart that is ready to tremble before God Lord you have given me this grace you have given me this glory 
but it is all yours. My life belongs to you. My resources belong to you. The influence belongs to you. The songs, the preachings, the everything. And you let the nations know. The safest position for a believer is to hide behind the cross. The safest position, hide behind the cross. The world will call you a fool, but you will last. Our obsession for celebrity living. And don't get me wrong. God is all about increasing men and giving him visibility, but the purpose is for his glory. You see that now? When it becomes about self, the marketing of self, making a name for self, now you are behaving like Nimrod in Genesis 11. Go to let us build a city whose tower will reach the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Let me tell you, my dear people, you never spend your life exalting Jesus and then become a non-entity. It's not true. In lifting him, you will find out that you are lifted too for his sake. I've given this example. Remember during our retreat? My focus is the top of this pulpit. But it's impossible to focus here and not see here. My Bible is not resting here. However, because this is what is supporting this, as I lift this, everything connected to it is lifted too. You see how it happens? Glorify now thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. So if God finds out that he's deriving great glory from your life, what happens is that he keeps lifting you for his namesake, empowering you for his namesake, honoring you for his namesake. This is what God does. So when you see the results behind this ministry and what God is doing, I'm teaching you this. For those who just came, for those who are family here, let me tell you the truth. Learn this as a principle. This is not about being humble. It's about being wise. When you try to take God's glory and let men see you, they will clap for you, but that will be the last time. But when you let men see him, they will clap for him. And it will be your joy to be the one lifting him like a trophy. And that applause will continue and remain for as long as you are there. It's a wiser bargain. The state of your heart. Place your hand on, on your chest and say, purify my heart. Go ahead. Pray in one minute. Purify my heart. Purify my conscience. Someone pray in one minute. And for those who are following across the globe, following on Koinonia Global, go ahead. Pray. Purify my heart. The first hindrance to coming up hither is a disinterest towards God and spiritual things. Second, the state of your heart. Hallelujah. See, many other things, I'm not going into them, but things like pride and so on and so forth, they are byproducts of a corrupted heart. An arrival mentality, you see that? Our generation is a proud generation. We have to trust God for grace. To repent from pride is a cancer. It kills. Literally. The moment you find yourself beating your chest or asking other people to help you beat your chest and say, well, you see it. It's still the same thing. Can a man receive anything that God did not give? Can a man heal any sick body Without the power of God? No. The doctors tell you to swallow the tablets. And even they cannot explain fully what happens after you swallow it. That one is between your body and the creator. Because there are times the tablet can decide to fight you. The tablet you say is not a living thing. It can fight you. And it knows where to go in your body and fight you till it kills you. So at that point, it's not medicine and surgery again. Is the creator's help. Is someone listening? That prayer purify my heart must remain your prayer even up until the evening. Let me give you the last key and we're done. What is the final hindrance that stops men from rising higher, being used by God mightily in their generations? Lack of proper mentorship and guidance. Lack of proper mentorship and guidance. You want to listen to this before we pray. 
lack of proper mentorship and guidance. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16 says, to stand in the old path, he says, the ancient path, it calls it 616 Jeremiah. He says, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. Please look at me, believers. There is a path in the spirit that leads to glory and leads to victory. There is a path in the spirit that leads to mediocrity and failure. Are we together now? No matter how desirous you have a good heart, agreed. You have a passion for the things of God, agreed. You will need to be guided. There are many paths in the spirit that lead men to glory. But until you are guided and helped, if you are not helped, you may not get there. There are many sincere people. I wrote something down here and I want you to listen. You will reflect the accuracy or the limitations of those you choose to follow. You will reflect the accuracy or the limitations of those you choose to follow. The implication of followership is that you will eventually be a reflection of the accuracy or the limitations. It's the reason why God is going to judge teachers. Because when people place their trust on you and follow you believing you are following Christ, by the time you manipulate, destroy, deceive them, the Bible, except you've torn it from your Bible, the Bible tells us that teachers will have a greater weight of judgment because influence is a trust. When people trust you to alter their minds, to shape their understanding, many of you will get up and make destiny-defining decisions based on the truth you have received now. And if I come here and lie to you and manipulate you and deceive you, you see that now? Look at the multiplier effect. You will teach what you have learned now to someone, maybe your group, maybe some children somewhere. That is the reason why as ministers of God, we must stay with God and cry for his mercy so that you don't bring things that destroy people. You can learn the truth and quietly correct yourself, but you would have led to a, a, a wide error. One truth that is not communicated properly can bring a mass dis I mean it can it can impede your progress in the spirit hallelujah in Acts chapter 8 from verse 26 the Bible talks to us about a, a eunuch a utopian eunuch he was on his way and the Lord spoke to Philip let's just read it arise and go down to the south Unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Uh -huh. He says, and he arose and went and behold, a man of Utopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Utopians, who had the charge of all her treasure. This was a very serious man and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Next verse. He was returning and sitting in his chariots. He read the book of Isaiah. Uh-huh. Next verse. Then the Spirit said unto him, Philip now, go near and join that chariot. Verse 30. And Philip ran thither unto him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest what thou readest. That man was reading. What he was reading was true, but he had no understanding. He said, how can I accept some man? My goodness. How can I except some preacher, except some teacher should guide me. The Bible says, and he desired that he would come up and sit with him. There are many people who's undoing spiritually today was not a product of rebellion. They only follow the wrong people. There are principles and practices they adopted to their spiritual life and adopted in ministry. Their hearts are sincere, but they only followed wrongly. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing prayer. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing the word. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing character and integrity. 
and moral excellence. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing relationships. Look at me. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing growth and transformation. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing wealth and abundance. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing attacks from Satan. They were wrongly mentored into trivializing the value of transformation. You will become a reflection of the accuracy or the limitations of who you choose to follow. In ministry, I've met many people, great people, good people. I remember the earliest memories of this um, was when we were the northern part now in Zaria, Kaduna State, Nigeria. I remember a gentleman who came, I was counseling, and he walked up to me, very arrogant and confident, and I looked at him, I said, wow, this is interesting. And I saw a spirit in a vision now behind him, just standing. And then I'm looking at this gentleman and he was explaining a few things. He just said he came so that we we'll agree and pray. And I looked at him. I was seeing what was wrong with him. I was seeing a spirit behind him. And then I politely tried to tell him, my friend, look, I'm seeing something behind you. And he, he shot me down immediately. No, no. Don't believe in those things. There's nothing wrong with me. I just came. I, I said, how do I help this man now? This is me watching this person like I'm watching a television. I'm seeing what is wrong with him. I'm trying to help him. And he's telling me, no, he just came so that we we'll agree. Anyway, I prayed for him. That gentleman woke up like after 15 minutes. And for the next one week, true story, he kept sending me text messages. I said, what is wrong? You've rattled my theology, everything I've been taught. I didn't believe this. Where do I start from now? Because that is like canceling everything I believe. I said, no, you don't have to cancel. Or edit what you believe. Not everything is wrong, but there are some things that are nonsense in the world of the spirit. You see that? Hmm. What do you believe about God? What do you not believe about God? What do you believe about Satan? What do you believe about failure? What do you believe about growth? What do you believe about prosperity? What do you believe about poverty? What do you believe about success, victory? What do you believe about defeat? Listen carefully. What do you believe about fasting? What do you believe about prayer? What do you believe about consecration? What do you believe about increase? It matters how you are mentored. When God wants to help a man, after you encounter Jesus, he grants you the opportunity to sit under the grace of a teaching priest who loves Jesus, has accurate understanding of the word, and loves you. Three things. He must love Jesus, he must have accurate understanding of the word and he must love you. Because any of these three that goes wrong, you are in trouble. If he does not love God, even if he loves you, you are still in trouble. You see that? Because he would download errors sincerely. The source is wanting. If he loves God and he does not love you, he will have, he will be cold-fitted towards getting the truth across to you. If he loves God and he loves you but does not have access to the truth, he will be like a sincere driver who says, enter the car, but I'm a learner. That's not wickedness. That's ignorance. He just wants to help you, especially when you are carrying all your children. Say, you and all your children come into the car. Your big luxurious bosses, he said, you just come in and be very comfortable. You can even go to bed while I drive. I'm learning, but I think I'm smart enough to navigate through the roads. You see that? It takes more than a good heart. It takes understanding. I have watched with humility sincere people being destroyed because of the demon of their ignorance. Your ignorance is always higher than you. You will be a slave to ignorance until the day you cry like the nation of Israel, I am tired and you declare an exodus out of that pharaoh of ignorance. You are learning the things you are learning now. Some of you never knew that success can destroy as much as failure. When Satan wants to bring failure to destroy you and you reject it, he will bring success. The most important thing is that he wants you destroyed. How is not his business? There are many breakthroughs that did not come from God. They were trapped by Satan. Because he knows that you have not been trained to manage success. So he will rush it to you. And you will receive it thinking it is breakthrough. And that becomes the reason for your death. 
it is not only the cross that can kill a crown can kill too there are many kings that died from their throne they didn't die on the cross satan wants you to die whether on the cross or on the throne the difference is purpose the one who dies on the cross dies towards getting to the throne the one who dies on the throne dies because he's a fool herod died and immediately worms at him nebuchadnezzar lifted up himself in pride and he became an animal for years but jesus died on the cross but that became the passage the new and living way you see that now so as we wrap up this morning we have an evening session and i must let you rest now and prepare this is a very it's called a prophetic convergence all our discussion was verse one after this i look that's all i've been saying this these four words after this i looked it is your responsibility to go and find the this that has distracted you use this opportunity before evening for someone is after the business success i stopped looking you have to repent it's time to look after the ministerial strides god is calling you if you want to get to this second realm chapter one has happened to you chapter two has happened to you reminded of isaiah chapter six verse one Isaiah starts with a powerful prophecy by a true prophet himself. But by the time we get to chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, what must die for you to see? Because you see, this whole scriptures is about seeing again. After this, I looked. For someone, this will be your version. After he died, I saw. After pride died. After lust died after carelessness died and don't say it does not matter if it is if you want to last you have to pay attention to this are we together this it does not matter is a spirit of carelessness it destroys people i don't pray but it doesn't matter i don't fast but it doesn't matter i don't love god i don't give there are some of you who don't give you see giving it's not the only key that, that makes you prosperous. Your value, your understanding. But giving connects you to the spiritual forces that bring you the assistance. I wish I had time. It's one thing, oh dear. The power to prosper has nothing to do with money. It is the power that advances men. You cannot go forward if you don't have it. You can have money without the power to prosper. But it will never bless you. Because wisdom brings wealth, but strength retains wealth. When it has to do with retainership, it's not wisdom again, it's strength. He says strong men retain. That is why you can get and it can leave. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Mentorship. This is what you are receiving right now. For someone you sacrifice the time you would have used doing certain things and you are sitting under this grace. From morning and even up until evening, you will be surprised how many years you have redeemed just sitting here right now. And I mean what I'm saying. How many years that heaven is rejoicing because perhaps for someone you are the only one in your family who has had an opportunity to come this far with God. Now you are redeeming. Did the Bible not say walk circumspectly as wise and not as unwise? It says redeeming the time. How do you redeem the time? By knowing early what the will of God is. Because when you know what the will of God is, you will act in keeping with that will and you will redeem time. Confusion is one of the ways that Satan aborts the value of time in your life. He keeps you moving left and right while time goes. That's why when God shows up, he brings both restoration and speed. These are the two ways God corrects issues of time. Because if you lose money, you can get it back if you have time. But if you don't have time, even if you have wisdom, you cannot use it. The value of everything you receive is that you have it, enough time to execute it. A dying man does not pray for wisdom. A dying man does not pray for favor. A dying man does not pray for connections. He prays for time. Ask Hezekiah. Because every other thing finds its value when there is time. 
So God brought this prophetic convergence because for some of you, you have wasted 30 years already, 40 years already, 50 years already. And if you keep going the way you are going, you are about to add another 10 years. And God has come by his mercy. That something needs to be done. Need to redeem time. Some of you, by God's prophetic blueprint, you would have been a prophet by now. But because from the time you got born again, you did not have the privilege of quality mentorship. And you kept listening to a lot of nonsense. You've been going around. Now you found out that you thought you were moving forward. But in the presence of higher light, you found out you've just been roaming around the same room. You've not even gone out of the room for 10 years. But not to worry. This is why he gives speed. This is why he restores. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. Did you hear what I was singing now? It may be a special number for you, but I'm not a musician. I'm pounding something into your spirit, man. By your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name, I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting. Ah, rejoice not over me, my enemy. Time may have gone, but I'm in the presence of the resurrection and the life. Is someone ready to pray? Please rise up on your feet. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive. To declare your victory, the resurrected King is resurrected. One more time. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory, the resurrected King. We're about to pray. Seeing then that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth easily beset us and to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. The Bible calls him the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy, here it is, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. Someone open your mouth and begin to pray. The grace to look and to keep looking. Looking beyond success, looking beyond failures. You may be a champion, but still look. It is only those who look that leave. It is only those who look that leave. I like you to pray. Let it be from the depth of your heart. Every distraction, every impediment to my rising in the spirit, I come against it in the name of Jesus. Complacency that has come as a result of my achievements, ministerial achievements, financial achievements, career achievements, family achievements, in the name of Jesus. After these, I still look. After these, I still look. After these, I still look. I look in prayer. I look in fasting. I look in the word. I look through consecration. After this, I look. Someone pray. In spite of the healing anointing, I still pray. I still fast. In spite of the commendations, 
I will still strive to know Him more, to love Him more, to live for Him. Hallelujah. We're wrapping up. After these things, I looked. After these crowns, after these challenges for someone, it doesn't matter what the this is, good or bad. If you have looked at it for a while, take your eyes away from it. Come up here that starts with looking hither, there is a higher realm. I've operated the prophetic, but there is a higher realm. I've operated the apostolic office, but there is a higher realm. God has blessed me financially, but there is a higher realm. God has helped my children, but there is a higher realm. Someone who desires more, cry the last prayer for this morning. More, more, more. More, more fire, more grace. Someone pray. Greater appetite for spiritual things. Loving Him more than my necessary food. Go ahead and pray. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus, more of you. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus, more of you. The more I see you, the more I want to see you, Jesus, more of you. Jesus, more of you. Helper, more of you, Redeemer, more of you, Savior, more of you. The more I know you, the more I want to know you, Jesus, more of you. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. While standing, let me just do two things. I just want to give a word about tonight and then just one more instruction and then we'll have um, the altar call and then we're done. Hallelujah. Tonight will be our final general session. I'll be taking the other parts and we're trusting God to be a time where we experience the move of the Spirit tonight. Be praying for the sick who will be ministering to us. Let me request everyone get the prayer requests of everyone you know and then yours too. Come by faith. Ushers, please take note so that when we come, we'll be able to receive this at a point in the service. I believe in the ministry of intercession. We're going to be praying over our requests. You've heard the testimonies that have come. And for those who are connecting across the globe, um, we'll start five, let's make it five UK time on the dot um, so that we'll be able to cover much. Praise the name of the Lord. We'll just have, once we come in, we'll go straight to the point, cut a lot of things so that we can have time. We'll just minister and then we'll have Sinach come bless us. And then afterwards, <laughs> hallelujah. Once that happens, we'll get straight to the word and we're trusting God to have a glorious time this evening by the grace of God. Make sure you come with your heart opened. Hallelujah. Now, there are, I know that there are so many people. Please, PR, let's find out. I don't want any space whatsoever. No chair should be empty. While there are so many people, we've had to stop. Literally so many people. So if there are still more spaces, I'm sure that most people maybe were at work or so. If there's any room, then we'll open more. If there are people who we left outside, please don't feel offended. Um, we had to limit everything because 
if we open and announce everything, even if we use a stadium, it will not be enough. So, um, but the point is, I want you to come with your heart hungry, ready to receive. Hallelujah. We've introduced this come up here. There's something else I want to show you tonight. And we trust God for a mighty move of the Spirit. And for all your loved ones who are trusting God for any kind of miracle, I want you to release your faith with them in the name of Jesus Christ. For all our precious workers, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, because most, most of our workers, I'm sure that um, you would be communicated uh, because most of the workers have been walking around, some right from yesterday, and whilst others are going to take a break, most of the workers are still around up until evening. It's usually a stretch for them. Um, we've, we've made um, arrangements for food for the workers, so please make sure that um, um, I'm sure that the leaders will direct, perhaps when I'm done, if they need any direction, please workers listen carefully so that you have it. We love everybody. Don't worry if you are not a worker. Just know that I, Joshua Selman, on behalf of Jesus, the son of the living God, that I love you with all my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. We'll also take, we'll also take some time. There are a few people we're expecting in the evening. We'll take the time to just acknowledge people uh, more intentionally. I didn't want us to um, stretch beyond this morning. Um, then hopefully by evening I would say another word over the sound of revival. I know that um, the, the hall can only take so much people. The um, first direct arena can only take 12,000 and it's exhausted completely. So we've been trying to walk around. I mean, I know some of you, the workers, you don't even have, you've not gotten a place. Please just be patient. We're seeing what we can do. If it means getting another hall, that's what we did in Canada. All the halls for U.S., Canada, U.K., it's all filled up. In fact, we filled up days. Um, so right now, for Canada, we're fortunate enough to have, and, you know, there's an overflow attached to it. So we've been able to get an overflow for 5,000 more people. Um, but for this other place, we're trusting God. So just pray with us and please be patient. It's not um, intentional. You know that once you hold meetings like this, it just goes to tell you how hungry people are for God. Are we together? So we'll do our best, particularly for some of you who are here and, you know, you've been wanting to register to become part of the workforce or, you know, part of those who attend on site. Um, please just give us some time. We're really working, trying to put all the factors we can put together. And we're having many options on the table, including visiting multiple cities if need be. I hope, who knows, maybe God will answer your prayer and will come to a city. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Have you been blessed? You need Jesus. Let me make an altar call. I don't take for granted any opportunity that makes for the gathering of God's people. I believe with all my heart that someone who came here this morning, you are in this place right now. And whilst you heard me speak, particularly when I began to speak about the disinterest for spiritual things, the Holy Ghost began to convict you. If that is you, you are saying, Apostle, do not end this session in the morning without giving me a chance to know Jesus, to love him, and then to serve him. Or perhaps you, you're born again, but you've not been serious with God. And you're saying, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I'm going to make five counts, one to five, wherever you are, very boldly, unashamedly so. I want you to leave your seat and come and stand right before me here. When I count five, I will begin the prayer. Don't wait for anyone to be the first. Very boldly, come and stand. I begin my counting now. One. Is there someone coming? Two, come. Koinonia, give them a big God bless you. Three, win that war finally, once and for all. I want to make it right with Jesus. The Bible says, as many who will come to him, he will in no wise cast away. 
No, we do not condemn you. It doesn't matter what you have done or what you have not done. Please come. Jesus is willing to give you a new beginning. Young, old, male, female, come. And for those who are watching by television, those who are connecting from across the globe, here's your chance to make Jesus Lord of your life. As I pray over this once, I want you to connect by faith. And this can be a new day for you. This can be the beginning of your best days. All of you in front, thank you very much. You'll be given a card by the counselors. Please, I want you to hold that card. And after the prayer, you'd be requested to fill it. Legibly, you will have a few people. The counselors will be having a word with you shortly. I want to thank you for this bold decision. Thank you. I see uh, so many people, parents coming even with their children. Thank you very, very much. I'd like you to say this after me as loud and as clear as you can. Say, Lord Jesus. One more time. Say, Lord Jesus. I have heard your word. I love you with all my heart. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose again for my justification. Right now, I receive Jesus into my heart as my Lord, my Savior, and my King. I declare that the power of sin, Satan, hell, and the grave is destroyed. I am a child of God. I go forward ever and backward never. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I speak over your precious people. I love them with all my heart. And I decree and declare based on the authority of Scripture, your sins are forgiven. I call you bona fide recipients of the life of God. And I declare that from tonight, you go forward ever and backward never. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, all of you, please, I want you to look at me. May I please request that you move this way. You see the counselors waving the placard. All of you in concert, they will have a word with you just for a minute or two, and then you're back. Let's honor them as they go. Hello, beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them. Because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. Tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And then if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching.